Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Tools, Techniques and Mental Models for Success series. In this series, we're looking at the various tools and mental models that will assist you in being more successful in running your business, running your projects and personal development. Today, we're going to be discussing the Critical Path Method. The Critical Path Method is an essential element to project management. If you like, it's kind of the engine that kind of runs projects. It's the methodology that's used to calculate the length of projects, and it's a well, well-known methodology that's very, very, very commonplace. So it's not one that's often ignored. And so I personally believe to be successful in running projects, it's good to know how the underpinnings of the critical path method works. Particularly, how does it get calculated? How do they come up with these numbers? Whatever project management software you're using, how is that coming up with the length of time of your projects? And in my training and development over the years with various companies and project managers and site superintendents, I'm, almost, I'm always kind of taken aback by how many people really don't know how it's actually calculated. And it's not a complicated process, really, once you get used to it. It's not that you're ever really going to sit down and calculate it by hand, but whatever software system that you're using to make the connections, it's doing the calculations in the background. And if you really don't know how the calculations are being made, it's very easy to make a mistake and not recognize the mistake is there. Uh, so I think uh, as a good starting point, it's good to have just a, a general understanding of how the calculations are made. I often say, uh, project management, planning and scheduling of projects is very much like estimating of projects. You know, you're, you're doing a lot of calculations and if you make one little mistake, it can really throw off things quite substantially. Like if you're estimating and you have one extra zero in a cell or one less zero in a cell, it really means a big difference in your project. So the same thing kind of goes with uh, scheduling projects and critical path method calculations if you have an extra zero in a duration or you make a mistake with a predecessor that can have a substantial impact on your ability to run projects and this is part one of a series that we'll talk about with the critical path uh, how, how it's actually uh, calculated what it is and others in the series of, well, how does that convert to like a Gantt chart or a bar chart? And then, well, what does that really mean? Because everything changes all the time. And so what does that mean with updating our, our projects and we're learning where we're at? And then what does that mean with getting ourselves back on track so that we can drive ourselves towards our original goals or communicate if we can't reach those goals uh, in the expected time that we originally understood that to be. So there's actually a whole wealth of information that's involved in this, but I think a good starting point today is just to get a, a handle on what the critical path is all about. And if you're just starting to learn about project management, this is a pretty good introduction to how it's actually calculated. So just to give you a little bit of a historical context, um, the timeline of project management, you know, projects have big mammoth projects go back thousands of years. You know, the pyramids uh, were built uh, more than 4,600 years ago. Of course, they weren't using modern uh, project management processes and they weren't under as tight a timeline typically as a lot of our projects are today. And of course, when we talk about uh, some of the constraints, uh, you know, goals uh, as far as safety uh, were concerned were not very commonplace and unfortunately, uh, a lot of moral and ethical issues would have been involved as well um, during those time periods that we uh, avoid uh, today and that we take care to ensure that we're meeting all of the government regulatory requirements. Um, a more recent uh, project, although not that recent, goes back to the Great Depression and it would be a good example is the Hoover Dam. If you ever get a chance to go out uh, to Las Vegas. There's usually day trips that you can take from Las Vegas out to the Hoover Dam. I took this trip uh, a little while ago and it's quite the um, experience uh, going through the Hoover Dam and the process that they went into building it. But 
even the Hoover Dam, it didn't use the critical path method to sort of develop the schedule for it. It was under very tight timelines that used what we call Gantt charts or what you'd better known as bar charts uh, as the, the foundation. I think if you search online, you can probably find some of the original bar charts for the Hoover Dam. And so at that time, it was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, Mammoth Project built during the Depression uh, using government money to try to get people to work, but also to have a great foundation in being able to um, conserve and redirect water and at the same time produce energy um, through hydroelectric uh, power generation. So um, Mammoth Project, very interesting project, uh, developed uh, using bar charts uh, from that perspective. Was not very safe either. We hadn't progressed that much uh, even in that time. I think um, uh, the uh, non-official deaths on the project was well over 400 people uh, on that project of actually building it that um, perished. Uh, I think the official number at the time was much lower, but um, that's uh, more um, the way that they were reporting things. Um, so you wouldn't be able to do that today, not in North America anyways, and uh, get away with that uh, from that perspective. So we have to run our projects much more safe, safely. And there's a lot more uh, technology available to us today. So the critical path method was actually, wasn't developed till the 1950s. So, you know, a good 20 years or more after the Hoover Dam was built. Um, there was kind of two methodologies that were kind of developed almost at the same time. One is PERT, uh, Program Evaluation Review Technique, a uh, very interesting uh, scheduling network uh, format that sort of puts in some factors, <coughs> excuse me, uh, factors regarding um, likelihood or possibility, so the most optimistic and pessimistic views. We'll talk about that one in another session, but focusing in on the critical path, which is the network diagram methodology of uh, developing the longest path through the project. So it's connecting all of the activities that are involved in the project, uh, connecting to them together to form a network. So that means, you know, what must happen for me to start the next activity? Uh, so if I'm in the next activity, what must have been completed? So looking back, what would be the predecessor? Or having completed the, that activity, what would be the successor? What comes next? What can I do at the same time? Can I have activities that uh, wait a period of time? Maybe I've got something to wait for in between one activity or another. Or can I have activities overlap each other? So we put them all together in this network. And that whole process of putting together the network, which involves a number of factors more than we'll discuss today, uh, is putting together the critical path. Because if we figure out all the activities we need to do for the project, and we gather up durations of how long they're going to take and we put them in the proper sequencing or schedule logic as we would use the terminology then at the end of that we should be able to tell how long our project is going to take and some activities in that network if they take longer our project will take longer notice i said some activities not all activities some activities will have what we call float or slack. That means they've got some flexibility before they start to push the project date longer. And what's helpful with that is if we have all that information, then we can see when things change on our projects because no matter what, things will change on our projects. And I think in one of our earlier uh, videos, we mentioned uh, Eisenhower and uh, the Eisenhower matrix, but he also has that phrase which is, Plans are nothing, planning is everything, which means things change and we have to be able to redevelop and be agile and be able to change our plans so that we can reconfigure them to get ourselves back on track. Well, if we develop the network, we can see when something is delayed, is that going to impact our project? If it's got lots of float, maybe it won't impact our project. But if it's on the critical path, we know it will. And so once that happens, then we can start thinking about, all right, well, that's already delayed us. Then how do we get the time back? And we'll look at that in one of the uh, further parts. But for now, as I said, we want to focus in on how is the actual critical path um, calculated. And as I mentioned, it's the long, just keep thinking, it's the longest path through this complete network of activities that you put into place. And if it, an activity on the critical path takes longer, the project will take longer. 
If an activity on the critical path is shorter, the project may be shorter because you could have two critical paths. So you shorten one, it doesn't necessarily shorten your project. If you only have one critical path, it would shorten your project up until something else becomes critical. Uh, so you don't always win when you shorten one single critical path, depends how the project is laid out. But if you understand how critical paths are developed and how they're calculated, it helps you to be able to understand how your project is going. So I've got in these next two or three slides a bunch of information here and you know this being uh, YouTube you can always just sort of freeze your screen and if you want to read through that you can kind of uh, get a, a good idea of it. To be sure we want to have a work breakdown structure and we'll talk about that in another uh, session. A work breakdown structure is taking a very large project and breaking it down into sections. It helps us to ensure that we don't miss key areas of work. Uh, and from the lowest level, once you got the, the headings, the areas of work, so like in a construction project, you might have the overall project and then you might have uh, pre-construction work, construction work as an example of headings, and in pre-construction you'd have under that all the things you need to do to get ready for the construction. And our construction, of course, we'd have the construction work, and under construction we might have things like substructure and superstructure and exterior envelope and building systems. So we would be breaking it down into smaller and smaller components until we actually get it all the way down to the lowest level of activities. So WBS helps to make sure we don't miss stuff. At the lowest level of activities, that's where the network is really formed. Activities to activities. I gotta finish this before I start that. You know, it's sort of right down at the lowest level. That's where the actual network is is taking place. And number point number three, I got draw a diagram. Well, when you're using a software program, you don't have to draw a diagram. And as I mentioned from the historical aspect of um, you know, Remington ran and how basically the critical path was uh, developed. Also, a Polaris missile project, I believe, was one of the earlier uh, critical path uh, projects. Um, it was really developed because these are mammoth projects and they're requiring thousands and thousands of activities. And how are we going to track this and have any idea what we're doing? Uh, critical path was one methodology could, that could take advantage of computer systems. And of course, we know over the years, uh, going from computer systems back then, that probably took you know a, a whole office uh, just to have the computers to be able to have you know something on your iPad that you can actually run a project from uh, becomes much easier. Now you can plan any kind of project uh, just using a simple software uh, programs, of which there's lots of them out there. Um, and uh, I tend to use Microsoft Project in a lot of my explanations, but I'm not wedded to any one software system. They're kind of the engine that's running it. So scheduling is scheduling. It's just trying to understand what the so a particular software system can do for you. But the fundamentals we're talking about today doesn't really matter if it's Microsoft Project, uh, Primavera P6, uh, Merlin, a whole host of other different uh, kind of scheduling softwares that are out there or soon to be out there. Uh, so really uh, the calculation process is using some simple algorithms and it's really broken down into two major uh, areas. You do what we call a forward pass and a backward pass to do the calculations. And really, if I, if I want to put it simply, it's just adding and subtracting. It's not rocket science. It's just adding and subtracting. But there's a definite process that's involved. So I've got this again, rules to follow when calculating the critical path. And Again, I don't want to uh, just read these off because I don't think it makes much sense. Uh, but if you want later, maybe when you look through the video and you might, oh, I'm not quite getting it, you might want to come back to this, freeze it, and just sort of look through it. And if you watch the, the video all the way through, you'll see how this actually um, works. Because I've animated a few things in PowerPoint to try to make it a little bit easier to understand. Because I find if you sort of sit and just read this, it's a little bit tricky or monotonous. So I'm going to do two cases today. One, a fairly quick one, just to get the, you know, the, the little gray cells uh, thinking about things. And the other one, just to walk you really step by step uh, through it. But let's say we have uh, a few activities. This would probably be within a bigger project, but let's just go with this. Uh, so we're going to put shingles on a roof. We're going to do a bunch of building systems rough-ins. We're going to have inspections and install the insulation. And so they're numbered and 
really any kind of scheduling program and uh, uh, CPM, it really works like a, a database program. You have different tables, different things communicating to each other. So we want to reference it with some sort of num numbering system. And we're going to have timelines. So how long do we expect these activities to take? And so let's say these are days, five days, six days, seven days, four days, two days, etc. And the predecessor is what must happen before something else happens. There's, you know, when you get into scheduling software, if you've got all the predecessors, predecessors laid out, you'd also have the successors. So that's another column. It's just how you're looking at activity. Predecessor means I'm looking back. Successor means what's coming next um, when I finish this. So if I, if I have shingle roof, what would be my successor? In this case would be electrical rough-in, HVAC rough-in, and plumbing rough-in. If I'm at the electrical rough-in, what must be done? before I start it. Well, I'm saying in this case, I want the roof shingled maybe so moisture doesn't get into where I'm working and that sort of thing. So that's sort of laying that out. And if you laid it out, the actual network that we've been talking about is these nodes or boxes, we call them nodes, and this is what we call an activity on node um, network, which is how most scheduling software does this uh, today. There used to be what they called an activity on arrow. Uh, where the activities were actually named on the arrows instead of the boxes. Um, but this is actually a much easier way for software programs to do it. It doesn't change any of the calculations, how they're done, really. Um, it's just a different format that's easier to display. And we have, I've got a little box here which has the abbreviations, early start and early finish, and late start and late finish. And we do a forward pass calculation. So that's starting from the beginning and working our way right to the end. And so the earliest we can start, I want you to just think of early start and early finish as like, I plan to start now and I plan to finish whenever. So it's just sort of when I plan to start and when I plan to finish. Um, late finish and late start is what's the latest I can finish and what's the latest that I can start given the information that I've provided. Uh, and you'll see in some cases late start and early start, they're the same thing. And if they are the same thing, then that means that activity is on the critical path. Um, so, uh, the, but the way the software works is it has to do the forward, forward pass before it does the backward pass. So that means you start at the beginning, you work your way to the end. So you start here and you work your way through the network to get at the end of the project. Um, so. Uh, if we're following um, that process, we would uh, basically have our early start is zero. That would be now. Our duration is five days. And so zero plus five is five. That would be our early finish. And then our early finish becomes the early start. And when you have activities that diverge out, then it's pretty easy. We just plug in the five into all three of them. And then we continue, we do the addition, five plus six. So early start plus duration equals early finish. And so that would be 11. Five plus six is 11. Five plus seven is 12. Five plus four is nine. Now, all three of these activities are merging in here. So that means that for inspections, we have electrical rough-in, HVAC rough-in, and plumbing rough-in as predecessors, right? So, um, when they merge in, we got to decide which number do we take of the early finishes. Well, we're saying that in this case, we're saying that all of these need to be done before we start inspections. That may or may not be true in the real world, but the way I've laid it out here is that they all have to be done before we start inspections. So um, we would take then, well, what do you think it would be? Just think about that. Which one would you go for? I've got to have them all done. So this is saying it would have to be, this is going to finish at the end of day 11. This is going to finish at day the end of day 12. And this is going to finish at the day, end of day 9. So we would have to go with the longest one, which would be 12. So 12 goes into there. Then we have uh, 12 plus 2 is 14. Early finish here, that go, becomes the early start over there. 14 plus 4 gives us 18. That means this project is going to take 18 days to complete following the way we plan this to be okay so that's 
following the forward pass, the backward pass, now we just go from the end and we work our way backwards. So going forward was a lot of addition, going backward is just subtraction. So we're going to take our late finish, minus 4, that gives us our late start, which is 14. So now we know that we're basically our late start is 14. This late start is going to move over here. Late start becomes the late finish working backwards. 14 minus 2 is going to give us 12. And now when they again diverge outward, that means we can take that 12 and we can plug it in here, here, and here. So that 12 goes moves over to there. 12 minus 4 is going to be 8. 12 minus 7 is going to be uh, 5. And 12 minus 6 is going to be 6. So we're now at this stage. And if we want to go backwards, well, then the simple thing for us to do is to look at the smallest number. Remember when we went forward and they merged together? We went with the larger number. Now we're going in reverse, so we use the smaller number. So in this particular case, we're going to be using the number 5 because it is the smallest number. And 5 minus 5 equals 0. It has to equal 0 or we made a mistake. So if we went all the way forward and we went back and we ended up with, I don't know, 3, Somewhere we've made a mistake. So if you've done everything right, it would be at zero at the end. And the next step would then be to calculate the float for each activity. So if we subtract um, the early finish from the late finish and we would have five uh, minus five, that would give us zero float here. 12 minus 11 would give us one or six minus five. So you can subtract the starts or the finishes, but it should give you the same number. If it doesn't for some reason, you made a mistake uh, somewhere along the line. So we've got zero, we've got one, we've got 12 minus 12, zero, or we've got uh, here, we've got 12 minus nine, three, or eight minus five, three. So three days float here. That means you got three days of flexibility of this activity. If you go over here, and kind of looking at it, you kind of know intuitively then this should be on the critical path, this should be on the critical path, because there's not other things going on at the same time. The bigger your project is, the more things you have going simultaneously, the more balls you have in the air. This way you can sort of see where you've got flexibility. That's the beauty of having the critical path. You know which activities you don't have flexibility on and which ones you do. It helps you to prioritize your efforts. It helps you to focus in on that 20% of activities that you deem to be uh, in jeopardy that could delay your project, et cetera, et cetera, using the Pareto principle. So we can see this has zero uh, and this has zero. So critical path in this case moves straight through here. And these two activities have float. This one has three days of float. So that means plumbing rough in, if it took three days longer to complete. So I've got a duration of four days. If it took uh, seven days, you know what? This would be critical and that would be critical. They'd both be critical. Uh, if this took five days long, longer, so that this, um, this has right now, let's see, what did we say it has? Three days of float. So we said three days longer, that would make this critical along with this critical. If this took four days longer, in other words, if it had a duration of eight days, then this would be critical and your rough in of uh, your HVAC would have one day of float. So it tells you where your flexibility is. And we know on projects things change when we actually start doing them. So it's nice to see that and it would show and calculate through the whole project the impact of these changes that are happening. And it becomes very important in project management to know what impacts are, are, ha are having on the project and who caused those impacts because perhaps you didn't cause the impact and it's some external force so you could potentially get relief, relief in time or money depending on what the circumstances are. So that calculation I just did is just over here in this chart. So if you're wondering where these numbers come from, it's the difference between the finishes or the difference between the starts. And that's where the float is. And wherever you've got zero float, it's critical. So that gives you a good idea. Um, what I want to do is now run through another example. And we'll keep this little formula up here. We're going to do the forward pass. 
we've got this little deck that's being built and we're going to excavate we're going to put sauna tubes the basically the round tubes for the concrete to support the foundation that'll be the foundation for the deck we're going to frame the deck rough in electrical rough in for a gas barbecue it's nice summertime out uh, install sprinklers frame the stairs install the decking and you can see these are the predecessors so that's the relationships so based on how you would want to have this set up you would develop the activities in these boxes you can see the id numbers are given based on how it's set up and so we're not doing number one that's more of a work breakdown structure heading for the whole project so we're starting in with number two and es early start early finish that's what we're going to do on the forward pass uh, so we're going to run that through and we're going to put all these boxes in a format that would make sense based on what we've got listed here because we can see some things are running a certain way and then we're going to connect all the arrows for uh, the activities which is connecting up the predecessors based on what's said i've actually got one missing that would be what we call an open end it's not connected and it needs to be connected so i think that's this one over here uh, which needs to connect grade and landscaping to install sprinklers. So that one needs to connect there. So it doesn't mean it connects here, right? It needs to connect where it says, where it makes sense to, and maybe because we're grading and landscaping all around, that's not going underneath the deck, so it's kind of kept separate on our layout for the project. So right now, we haven't figured out uh, exactly, well, where is the critical path? Let's, let's start and so where we would start is from now and um, where now is is zero and add three to it which is the duration three days so that gives us an early finish of three days so the early start is zero duration is three and the early finish ends up being three days now for those of you studying the pmp project management professional uh, certification i believe in their certification in the actual um, documents I, I don't believe i know uh that that they start with one and they use that as the starting point and it just throws the way the numbers are off by a little bit this is a much easier way to do the calculations and this way of doing the calculations actually works better if you're having to do um, the pmp test uh, which is a lot of questions and they're forced into a very tight timeline so you got to be very quick if you got to make calculations with it so this methodology is actually um, the best methodology to use in understanding and being able to calculate it out, in my opinion. Uh, so it, it really start with zero, but if it doesn't really change the way the calculations are done. I think it's just easier to teach and easier to follow. So zero plus three days, three. And then the next step is where that early finish is gonna become the early start and then so that three moves over three plus one becomes four and then the same thing happens that four goes over here and then four plus four becomes eight and then we've got uh, the eight well like i said you can move that into um, these four areas uh, so that basically it moves over here it moves over there it moves down here and it moves over um, from the early finish uh, to the early start over here okay so those all have clicked in and moved over to those spots so it's very quick we can move them um, when they're diverging outward when they're diverging outward very quick to uh, put them in and then we just got to do some adding 8 plus 2 is 10 8 plus 2 is 10 8 plus 6 is 14 8 plus 1 is 9 right um, so that should uh, fill in those numbers and so then the next thing is we've got to put in our early starts and now they're merging inward so we have to look at our early finishes for the activities that are merging inward uh, so one of the things I really want to note is it's only this activity this activity and this one down here that's merging into this box so we should ignore this one for now all right so uh, that means if we look at this, we've got an early finish of 10, we've got an early finish of 10, and we've got an early finish of 9. So in this case, we should use the number um, 10, which will take us over there. 10 plus 2 is going to give us 12. Okay, so we got 10 plus 2 is 12, 
and so 10 plus 2 is 12. Now we can move this one here. 12 should be going over uh, at this point. And so it's going to go over to here. So 12 plus 1. Um, sorry, we're going to have 12. And then we're going to go 12 plus 1. It's going to give us our early finish. And so we've got 13. And now we've got to come back and we've got to look at this one. Because now this is merging into, we've got our... Uh, sprinklers and we've got our install railing and they're moving into the the grade and landscaping activity so in this particular case we are going to um, take the larger number and the larger number in this particular case is 14 so of those two 13 and 14 14 was the larger number 14 plus 5 is going to give us 19 and then 19 is going to come over here and we're going to have 19. This is a milestone, which is basically just saying it's finished. So 19 plus 0, it's going to be 19. So we know our project now is going to take 19 days to complete, 19 working days to complete. And so that means that when we get over here, these two will be plugged in at 19.2. This is for sure on the critical path. The last activity will be on the critical path. That's a for sure. And then we can do our backward pass. And the backward pass is just working our way backwards. So we're now taking late start. That's going to become the late finish. All right. So um, we're going to have the late start is going to become, sorry, the late start is going to become the late finish over here. And so that becomes 19. And then we're going to do some subtracting. 19 minus 5, that's going to give us 14. So our late finish minus our duration gives us our late start. Late finish minus duration gives us our late start. And then our late start um, equals the late finish uh, of the predecessor activity. So we're going to basically move this here. Uh, and that's going to be equal our late finish over there. So that's going to continue that process um, through. So we got 14 minus 1. That's going to give us 13. And then we're going to have 13 minus... Uh, that becomes our late finish. 13 minus 2 is going to give us 11. So uh, where we've got 11 here, we can now plug that in because they're diverging. Just like we did with the forward pass, we can plug that 11 into here. We can plug it into here and we can plug it into there. So we've got three spots it can go, uh, which will make things a little bit easier. And we can do the math on that. 11 minus 2 gives us 9 move it into here it's going to be similar 11 minus 2 is 9 and don't forget the bottom one there uh, where it uh, links up and that's going to be um, 11 minus 1 and that's going to give us 10. now we, we can't forget this one so we're, we'll do this one as well uh, so we've got over here 14 14 is the late finish and we got 14 minus 6 is going to give us 8. so now they're all merging inward going in the backward pass you remember the forward pass what did we take in the forward pass we took the larger number in the backward pass we take the smaller number the forward pass we were waiting for the longest activity to complete this reverses itself when we do the backward pass so we have to look up through here and we have to see um, when we're looking through here uh, of the activities, which one that we're going to take. We're going to take the smaller number. So we've got 9, 9, we've got 8, and we've got 10. So we're going to take the 8. The smaller number, 8 minus 4, that's going to give us 4. 4 is going to move into late finish. 4 minus 1 is going to give us 3. The 3 is going to move over here. And 3 minus 3 is going to give us 0. All right. So We've just done the calculation of the forward pass, the backward pass. It did equal zero. If it didn't equal zero, we would have a problem. It does equal zero, so we did it correctly. Uh, so now what we'd want to do is figure out, well, what is the critical path in this example? Uh, if you went by my previous example, you might have thought, okay, it's going to just run straight through. Well, that's not true in this particular case. So what we're going to do is we're going to subtract the finishes or the starts and so in this case we can see that's zero four minus four three minus three zero eight minus eight four minus four that's zero so that's looking like it's a critical path and then we could do these up here eleven minus ten that's one that's got float that activity this has float one 
This one's zero. So that means that's going to be on the critical path. 14 minus 14 or 8 minus 8. And down here we've got 11 minus 9. So that's got float. So we can sort of see how this is evolving, that this is going to fall through here. This is showing us here 13 minus 12. There's one day of float. One day of float. And then we check this out here. Zero float. Zero float. So looking at this, the critical path is going to follow along here. And it's going to go up. And it's going to follow along there. So if we follow that through, we can see the floats being put in. And I can see that where I've got flexibility. This activity has one day of flexibility. You know what? I'm using small numbers here. That could be one week of flexibility. That could be one month of flexibility. It depends on size of your project or the scope of your project, right? Down here, we've got two days of, of flexibility. Very good tool. I know what I really need to ensure gets done. And you know, if, if my uh, electrical sub, it says it's going to take a day longer, I'm not really sweating it that much because it's not going to delay my project. Uh, if my, if my, um, Sprinkler sub says it's going to take longer. I'm going to be kind of concerned because I know that's going to be delaying my project. So different, different ways of interpreting the information is very, very helpful. And you'll see when we do other parts to this series, you'll see how when I need to get the time back, I look along the critical path on the rest of the project. Where can I save time to get it back? Very, very helpful to be able to do that. Um, so those are the float calculations. And I've just cut and pasted these from that earlier slide that sort of has the rules, uh, which is helpful. And again, you can go back and maybe look at that slide and just freeze it up and just take a look at it and you'll get a better sense of how those calculations um, took place. And um, so as I got these floats in, you can f follow through and you can see where the critical path uh, is following on your project. So we have what I think we've got 11 activities on this. And you can see there's four, five, six of them that are on the critical path and five of them that have float. So depending on the size of your project, sometimes it's fewer, more, less, but at least you know where it is. So it's giving you a good idea of how the critical path works, how it's calculated. And really, I like to think of it as it's the underlying engine that kind of dictates how the schedule is running. You know, there's a lot of information on project management and it's not as simple as it seems. So I'm not here to say this is the be all to end all. Uh, how do we know how long things are originally in our project? How do we get that sequencing right? There's some variables in there, uh, a lot of variables. It's a tool. It's a tool that helps you figure out how to run your project. It's not the only tool. There's a lot of tools. And I like to think of something as not being wrong or necessarily right. It's a tool. And if it's used in the right way with other tools and combined with a whole bunch of uh, interpersonal skills, soft skills, technical skills, it helps to pull together things so that you can effectively manage and successfully run your project. So it's one of many things that we'll discuss in our series that helps you to better run your projects. But don't go away thinking this is it, this is the tool. It's an important tool and you should understand how it works and it'll help you visualize things and it'll help you better lay out goals uh, to meet goals. Uh, but it's not the only thing. And we'll talk about how it integrates. You know, we, we look at a long-term schedule, a master schedule, and how it fits in with some short-term planning, uh, short-term look-aheads. There's in lean construction methodology. Uh, there's what we call the last planner and daily scheduling, and daily huddles, and weekly and monthly, and how these all integrate together in future sessions. Because I think if you start to get a better picture and understanding how there's flex and how you can move towards things, it will help you to be more successful. In part two of this series, I want to get into um, the bar chart. Most people in, that do any kind of project management are pretty familiar with the bar chart and it shows the critical path. In this particular case, it's in red. I just did this quickly up based on that little schematic that I did earlier. Uh, and if you uh, see it in Microsoft Project, uh, it'll show you um, start, finish, late start, late finish. Well, start and finish, that's your forward pass. Late start, late finish, that's your backward pass. And slack, that's the same as float. And that's the difference in dates. So if you actually take some time and you look at this, these time periods are exactly the same as the float that was just calculated. And that's how the scheduling software does it. It calculates it the same way. 
Um, so, for example, uh, this is uh, Thursday uh, for the late finish here and for the finish um, uh, over here. That's Wednesday. That's one working day difference. This is two working days difference. So that's why it's going to Tuesday. It's just the same. It's just it's using dates. I was just using durations with it. Schedules is when we get into actually using dates uh, and scheduling dates. Planning is where we're kind of looking at all the things that we need to do and we're trying to gather a plan and trying to figure out our best approach to it. Schedule, you're actually putting dates and commitments to it. Um, so uh, this is just running it through on an actual bar chart. People like bar charts because it's linear. The, the longer the, the, longer the uh, bar is, the more days, and it's kind of very more intuitive that way. Modern software has tied the best of both, the bar chart and the critical path method. I mentioned that the Hoover Dam was built with bar charts, and it was, and it didn't have all these connections and calculations for critical path, uh, but it did have the bars. The, the downside of that was it was hard to update and it was hard to see the impacts on the overall uh, project. Whereas critical path is taking that network diagram, you can gather that information through the bar chart, and whenever you're using a scheduling software, there is a network diagram that's been made, and we'll look at that in uh, the next session. Um, so part two, um, what I would call the engine, which is how this is actually driving our project and how we use it today. Uh, um, but it's fundamentally what's underneath it. So please, um, if you've enjoyed this, uh, don't forget to subscribe to my uh, YouTube uh, channel. Uh, we're building this community of, uh, of uh, points in the area of business management, project management, and personal development. So hopefully uh, over time we'll have a really good library of stuff and I, I can only get better with uh, comments uh, from you and having enough uh, subscribers that have interest in this particular area. And uh, also if you really want to dive deep, I've written a textbook on this uh, topic, not that I'm pushing the textbook so much, it's uh, really been used in a number of colleges and universities, uh, project management, planning. So it's really planning, scheduling and control of construction projects. It's uh, through American technical publishers, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, and I've also put my website, which I'm currently developing, and over time there will be a lot more information uh, provided that way. So have a wonderful day, and happy travels, and we'll talk to you soon. All the best. Tom Stevenson signing out.